let's just rip it out. At the end of the day, this is gonna be easier. You have to kind of stop and think to yourself, what is going to net the best result? And put schedule aside for just a moment and really think about what is going to give us the best quality. What's up guys, it is episode 10 of Coffee Break and this week we're over in our Weston project and I wanted to talk about something that's really relevant. Uh, today's July 6th and this week we actually have it off. And a lot of you guys reached out when I posted that on Instagram that we're, we take the entire week off uh, for the week around Ju July 4th. Uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, I didn't really look into it too much and I didn't realize the holiday was actually the, the Friday prior, which would be last, last Friday the 3rd. Uh, but every year around July 4th, we take the entire week off. And the big question I got was, is that paid? And is it paid for everyone? And the answer is yes. Everyone in the entire company gets the week paid time off. Uh, so I wanted to dig into kind of how our vacation policy, policy is structured. So what we have is we have mandatory vacation time. Uh, and I always say it's two weeks, but it's actually a little bit more. So the week around July 4th, whether that's the week uh, that July 4th falls within, if it's on the weekend, we decide to figure out which one makes sense. Like I said, this week, apparently it's uh, last, the last Friday that was celebrated. We chose to use the week after. And my mindset there was everyone's going to be on a, at a barbecue on Sunday and you know what? Let, let them take the week after that uh, and kind of recharge. It's perfect because it's right in the middle of the year. You know, you're starting off month seven with a quick, you know, one week break, get to recharge. You know, it's paid, so you're, you're not worrying about from, from, from the financial side of it. We also do this around Christmas. So Christmas Eve is off and we don't come back to work until um, after New Year's Day. And why we do that, same exact reason, end of the year, Production's a little bit low. Lots of people are taking time off to be with their family anyway. So they're they were, I found them to be exhausting their vacation hours around that time. So I said, you know what? It's too cumbersome to get guys, get the schedule to work with everyone. So why don't we just take, shut down the company these two times a year and ma make it mandatory? Because also, you know, I was one of them. I didn't take a lot of vacation because it just wasn't, I, I never wanted to. And there's guys here that just refuse to take it. So this gives the, the and, and I know how important it is now, especially with kids, this actually forces it. Now on top of that, we also accrue vacation. So that vacation accrual, it works out to about 40 hours additional and it's accrued per hour. And I, and I believe the math is 0 0.04 hours for every hour worked. And if you're working a, uh, you know, 52 weeks, 40 hour weeks, you're, you're, comp, uh, you're basically multiplying that by 2,080 hours, giving you somewhere around a week. Uh, and for the first two years that you work with us, that is capped at 40 hours. So you're getting another week. So it really works out when you, you come on board with us. That first year, you get three and a half, roughly three and a half weeks of vacation. So you have 40 hours in the bank, you take a day off and now you're down to 32 hours. Well, once you come back to work after that eight hour uh, day off, you start accruing that back again. So if you're working overtime, you might accrue that and, and gain more than 40 hours. So that's how we're structured. The longer term, the, the longer you're here, the more opportunity there is for additional vacation time on top of that. Because we really understand that mandatory vacation is great. It's great for the company. It's great for everyone to recharge at the same time, not have the pressure of who's working, who's not. But it also, it's not the end all be all because some people take other weeks off during the, the year to be with their family, or maybe they, you know, they only get to see their family at a different time of the year and it doesn't, it doesn't work out with the mandatory weeks. So that's why we add, we, we've offered that accrued vacation time. So like I said, both mandatory vacation time, both mandatory vacations are completely paid. All employees get uh, their typical weekly check. And then on top of that, they're getting accrued paid time off. Um, so it's vacation and, and sick time is kind of the same thing. So it's, PTO paid time off. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, and I hope this actually starts to split her out because I, I, I took a lot of the inspiration from this from, you know, other company, uh, other countries where they have these mandatory shutdowns and, and, and opportunities to really recharge. And I feel as though in America, everything is so fast paced and it's like now, 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 now. And being that we're quality driven and we try to, you know, work with a more realistic schedule and maybe a more fluffed schedule so we have the opportunity to have more time. I also understand that it's really important for these guys to recharge. So again, not working these guys to the bone uh, day in and day out and never giving them the opportunity to spend time with their family or take time off or take time for themselves. So it's really important in, in our company. Uh, and I, and I, I want to use the word culture, but it 
it is really important to us, to me as a, as a leader and an owner. And I really think I would, you know, I challenge you guys to, you know, maybe implement something uh, within your company where it's you, you take the whole time, the, the a big portion of time off for the entire company to recharge. Uh, and whether or not whether or not you do that together, you guys throw a barbecue as a company, or you guys all split your your separate ways, either is a really good avenue. So I hope that answers the question. Second question we have um, pertains to the rip it out mentality that I've been talking about. So this is just how I operate. Uh, if if something you know I'm actually in in Western right now, and I showed up on site and the mud pan they were, uh, I showed up on site and they were working on the mud pan in the shower. And we're looking at it and realize that there was an oversight yesterday that they didn't realize a, a certain uh, finish floor elevation. So they were gonna start grinding this mud pan down. And I, I, I said, listen, let's just rip it out. Like at the end of the day, this is gonna be easier. You're gonna get the better result. I get that that puts you behind. I get that that impacts the schedule. I get that. But are we really going to be achieving the quality and the goal by trying to grind it down and work within that? Ultimately, we we did. They, we, we chipped it out and report the, the mud pad. Actually helped because I, I did kind of feel bad that I made him rip it out. But at the end of the day, this was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do and it was going to net the best quality, even though it's gonna impact the schedule and, and we're gonna lose a day here because now we can't set the drain and every, all, every, all of this compounds. It's, it's so minor right now because five, 10 years from now or whatever, like a week from now, that little that day loss is is less felt th than if we installed something and the tile had a lip to it for the rest of you know the the life of this project if every time they stepped in and had this little lip and we knew in our mind that the lips there because we did, did a bad job grinding or something like that you have to kind of stop and think to yourself what is going to net the best result and put schedule aside for just a moment and really think about what is going to give us the best quality I'll tell you another example, and I talked about this on my story just a few weeks, uh, just last week. Over at our Calm Ave project, we put these two pieces of quartz uh, full slabs on the wall, and the shower is roughly eight by eight on that back wall. I, I'm, 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 I know I'm off, it's probably closer to seven by seven, but either way, they're two vertical slabs with a seam in the middle. When they put this together, and they, what they do is they actually photograph the two slabs, and they try to line up the vein to the best of their ability because the veins aren't obviously continuing from slab to slab. So they t f try to find two slabs that have a vein that they can kind of shift and move around and line up. Now, from, you know, if I were to step back here, it looked pretty good. But when I stepped here and even closer, the, the, the problem was is this is where I'm gonna be in the shower if, you're, if, the, if the camera is the wall. I'm gonna be in that shower, using that shower every day, and at camera height, actually, is where that, that vein was. And on the bottom, it didn't line up by inches, but the way it kind of transitioned and smoothed out, you didn't notice it as much as the top, where it was basically two hard edges coming to the seam, and they were about 3 16 off. Now, I look back and like, all right, well, first, how, what, what should we have done? Well, what we should have probably went to the stone yard, and, and see the, and, and looked at that layout. Or when it was being installed, said, hold on, pause, we gotta fix that. Let's, let's trim off the, the top of the stone and push that up 316 so it looks like it carries through. That was the intent, it was just, it was a mark that was missed. Not a big deal, um, it, it's, you know, stuff happens, but we need to fix this. And unfortunately, you know, well, not unfortunately, but the client also noticed and, and brought it to my attention. I said, listen, you know, guys, I totally understand. I, you know, I'm aware of it and we're going to fix it. If that means ripping it off the wall and cutting a new piece of stone, then that's what it is. And we have to understand that the reason I say that and the reason I can, I can say that is because we're being hired to produce at a certain caliber. That certain caliber also, of course, has a certain price tag to it. So yes, we're, you know, there's a premium to working with us and putting out really, really high quality work, but that also allows us to think, look at that and say, you know what, we're gonna have to rip that stone off the wall and replace it. That's gonna come right out of my bottom line. And whether or not that make, means I break even on the job, whether I lose money on the job, or I just have enough on the job where I can take, take a hit, it doesn't matter. I've done it where I've taken it. I've, I've done it where I've taken a complete hit. I've taken a $40,000 hit on a small project, but it was never the consideration of whether or not we were gonna do the right thing. That was totally secondary. So going back to the stone, we look at it and I said, you know what? 
I have an idea. I'm going to reach out to someone that can faux paint. They've done faux painting on stone for me before. I'm just fearful that it's in the field. It's a polished slab. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it when it's painted or feel it, right? And if it's in the shower, you know you're going to rub your hand on that all the time, especially now that they know it's there. We ordered a sample. Jess from Alternative Finishes uh, started testing with it. She etched the stone, painted it, blended it, polished it back up. She's like, I think I can do it. I'm, I'm confident I can do this. So she got on site, she etched the stone, painted it. She actually lined up the top edge, lined up the bottom edge and flared it way out just so, you know, hey, we're here. And then there was two tiny little veins at the top and bottom that you would never notice, but she was like, you know what, I'm here, let's do it. Make this thing look as though it was one piece of stone. And that's exactly what she did. She achieved it, she killed it, she crushed it. And I went on site and I'm, I'm trying to look around, look around, you know how when you look at stone and it has a polish and has a reflection in it, you're looking around to see where, like maybe there's a tool mark, like you're trying to get something to reflect. You could not see it at all. And ultimately, you know, that'll cost a couple hundred dollars. Not gonna go back to the client, not the client's fault. You know, we, it was on, our, uh, on us, we could have caught that. You know, the argument is, well, shouldn't, have you, shouldn't you have caught it in the beginning? Should it not have ever happened? Yeah, of course, but again, stuff happens. And it's about how we work through that. You know, and my first reaction was that I was gonna rip that stone off the wall and redo it. And that would have trickled into the waterproof plaster being delayed. That would have trickled into re-waterproofing the, the shower because we probably would have damaged it. But, you know, then we started thinking, like think creatively, like how do we solve this without impacting the job too much? So that all, you know, it's always that, hey, we're going to solve this. And if that means ripping it out, we're ripping it out. But you know, then we start going down that creative process. Like, how do we do that without impacting the job to a level that might be more impactful and trickle throughout many trades and many days or possible weeks? And that's ultimately what we came up with. And that, you know, I could go on and on and talk about this all the time, but it's really important to put that first. If you're putting out a quality product and that's what you're advertising and you run into an issue, you need to absolutely stand behind that. And when something goes wrong, don't hide it. You know, if, if, you know, and I'll speak to business owners as well as the guys working, the employees, the carpenters, cabinet makers, project managers, if there's a mistake, stop. Don't try to keep moving and try to cover it up, you know, and I, I don't want to put my guys on blast, but there was an, there was a the situation a couple months ago, same thing. They, they made a mistake and we had manufactured a piece of wood in a, in a, in a long length to make sure we didn't have seams and there was a miscut. It happens. I get it. And unfortunately, you know, for the situation, they felt as though let's try to not necessarily cover it up. I'm not saying that they were being, um, you know, secretive, but they tried to fix it because they didn't want to impact the schedule. And ultimately I was on, I went on site. I knew about it. I looked at it. I hated it. It wasn't what we were trying to achieve. And we ripped it out. We ripped the entire thing apart and it was way more complex because it was way more complex doing it that way. Because if they had just stopped and said, I made a mistake, we could have stopped and we could have installed it at a later time and been more on top of it. So when you run into a situation like that, it is about how you react, but always understand that your job is to put quality first and your client is paying you accordingly. So if your client, your client is paying for really, really high quality and you miss, it's your job to correct it. So I, I am absolutely going to roll with this. It's the rip it out mentality. Um, so it, I would challenge you guys, if you on Instagram or uh, YouTube or whatever, if you guys have ever done something like this, I'd love you to hashtag rip it out mentality, because I think this is something that needs to be talked about more and we stop hiding these mistakes uh, and, you know, almost celebrate them and realize that we're all human. We all make mistakes and it's how we deal with them that makes us different. So guys, have a great week. We will be back to work on the 13th, which is next Monday. Uh, happy 4th of July to everyone, and we will see you next week.